welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dorothy Byrne and I'm the president of Murray Edwards College here at Cambridge. But I'm also the former head of Channel 4 News and Current Affairs, which is probably why they have asked me to chair this session, which undoubtedly is going to be the most important session of the whole festival, because we are going to answer the question, or they are anyway, can political innovation come from a crisis? In other words, um, I'm assuming, I don't know about you, that they've got all the answers to everything that is going on. So presumably they thought, because I was a journalist, you know, I knew about what was going on. But I think what we have realized in the past couple of years is that political pundits and politicians, and I'm afraid to say professors, um, uh, turned out not to actually know anything. know anything at all. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but when I listen to Radio 4, and there's some bloke on, and sorry, there are nearly always blokes, um, telling me all about Ukraine, I think, wait a minute, you're the bloke who told me that Putin wasn't going to invade Ukraine. And then when they're telling me about COVID, one moment they're telling me not to worry, and then the next moment um, they say that we're all going to die. So, um, but what I would say is that um, they're not quite as bad as our politicians. However, someone has revealed to me the very interesting fact that the large majority of the politicians who've messed up this country actually went to Oxford, and that there hasn't been a prime minister from Cambridge for 100 years. So I think Cambridge gets off a bit on that one. Now, although I've slagged professors a bit, um, I am obviously exempting the two fantastic people that we've got with us today. Um, first, um, and I'm going to tell people, I hope you don't mind, Arshin, that you actually have COVID, so it's incredibly kind of you uh, to stay away. Um, no, to, <laughs> to come when you're not well. Um, so Arshin Adib Mogadan is Professor in Global Thought and Comparative Philosophies at SOAS, and he's also a Hughes Hall Fellow. David Runciman here is a mere... Um, a professor of politics at Cambridge. I mean, you are not a professor in global thought, are you? No. I mean, are you already feeling a bit inferior? Yeah, and smaller. And smaller, yes. So our format for tonight is that first, Arshin is going to give us some of his thoughts, and I might ask him one or two things or not for five minutes, and then David the same, and then we'll have a chat for a bit, and then um, there will be, uh, you will get your chance to ask questions. Uh, so start thinking of good ones now. And also, we've got apparently an enormous audience at home, and they will be asking questions. But I've made a special request that we only get good ones. Don't pass on any duds. So, um, uh, Fire away, Arshin. Um, can political innovation come from a crisis? Please give us a bit of good news. Well, to honour my title in uh, Global Thought and also um, to do justice to what you said about uh, some of the stealthy and macho language um, of, of politics, or actually to counter it, I'm going to start with a, with a poem um, and then I will try to connect it to some of the themes that, that you mentioned. This is a poem called Bani Adam, Humankind, um, by Saadi, a Persian genius, really, of the 13th century. And this is what he had to say about interdependencies, um, and that will give us, I believe, a good indication of how political innovation can be implemented, and certainly the language of political innovation. So this is the poem. Human beings are members of a whole, in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. So here we have a real emphasis on the complexity of the world we live in, right? 
Um, the very fact that Saadi is pointing out here um, that you know things are interdependent, and if one thing happens here, then it has an effect on what happens somewhere else. And the same with um, you know what is happening in Ukraine does have an impact psychologically, mentally, economically, and on every in every realm of human connectivity with what is happening um, uh, elsewhere, certainly in Europe, but globally as well. And I had the same sentiment of interconnectedness when the wars on terror happened, certainly the pandemic, um, and, you know, as indicated, the current crisis in, in Ukraine. So uh, I do believe that political change can happen, um, but then we would have to think about how and to what end? And I believe an acknowledgement of um, you know, a universality that we are living in, uh, away from the platitudes of globalization, but based on really a humane um, and human emotion that you know, brings us all together, I think that should be the starting point, really, of um, any political innovation. We lost that, I believe, in the 21st century, which seems to me by far more mechanic and stealthy um, to some of the language that we did have in the 20th century, for instance. Oh, thank you very much. Can I just ask you one thing um, that I th you've said that's really relevant to the fact that we are here? You have said that universities are disempowered now and that um, the humanities and social sciences um, have been disempowered and the locus for truth has been emptied and that innovative ideas should be coming from universities. So I'm very interested in view of where we are now, wh what you feel about the extent to which universities like Cambridge can be playing and should be, uh, and your own institution, and should be playing a key role in finding some of the politically innovative ideas we need? Uh, certainly, Dorothy, it used to be that way. I mean, uh, again, if we go back even to the first quarter, the first kind of the early 20th century, the big political ideas used to be produced um, at places like Cambridge, Oxford and elsewhere, right? So it's not as if this is something that is totally alien to, to history. It used to be that way. Um, universities used to be laboratories um, of, of thought, um, and people actually listen. Now, um, there is no uh, suggestion here that we need to go back to, you know, the big platonic intellectuals who sit on their pedestal and tell everyone what to do. Um, but a good dialogue between society, the state, um, and universities as a part, as a pivotal part of a civil society, I think is essential. For, for democracies to, to function. Um, and one of the reasons why we are more susceptible to political crises, even um, provoked from without, I believe is that disempowerment of civil society institutions such as university. Certainly not in the hard sciences, and we saw how that prevented this horrible pandemic to get worse. But in the humanities and the social sciences, we're sort of lagging behind. We have laboratories as well, we have ideas as well. Um, and they actually do prevent wars and, and you know, other, other nefarious forms of, of uh, human interaction as well. Um, but in the 21st century, we are kind of scattered. We are um, not, uh, you, we don't hold the tools anymore to, to affect things. And I don't believe that's good for society, the state, um, and democracy in general. So if we don't hold the tools, uh, what can we do about that? One of the things I've noticed in the brief period I've been in Cambridge is some people seem to be afraid of controversy and con controversial ideas at the moment. And it seems to me, as someone from outside academia, that um, if academia is afraid of controversy, they cannot play their role in helping to bring big new ideas into society that are going to help us? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is that degree of self-censorship um, because people feel they are by far more embedded and confined um, these days than they used to be. There are interests permeating the university as an institution that are not geared to truth-seeking in the way that we would define it, but to, to other interests. So there is that, um, uh, that, that factor of, of self-censorship. Apart from the, the general political culture, um, that does not necessarily lend itself to, um, let's say, radical or progressive critique, how you, however you want to put it. But again, in order to interrogate, in order to seek, um, you know, solutions, one has to be able to question pretty much everything, and that's essentially what the humanities have been all about. Uh, since they were they were invented, and even before, and that's why I went, you know, all the way back to the 13th century, um, in order to show that, you know, that idea of, of, uh, you know, human connectivity, society, community, um, is is an ancient one, and it binds us together not only within our society but further afield as well. Thank you. So, David, I think you come at seeing these issues from a different sort of direction, so far away. Yeah, so I tend to think about these things historically. I mean, the answer to the question is obviously yes, right? I mean, I think it goes without saying that political innovation can come from a crisis, and on the whole, that's how political innovation has come. I don't think I'm one of those people who believes that universities are going to be where it starts, but it is true that when a crisis comes, people do look around for ideas. Uh, you're famously, they often look around for ideas from the past. But the thing that I'm most struck by in the crises of the 21st century, so the financial crisis, and I'm seeing this from primarily a Western perspective, but the financial crisis, the COVID crisis, now the Russia-Ukraine war, is that people's responses do tend to be backward looking. So the, the crises that produce innovation tend to be the ones, and I'm, I'm afraid to say they are often wars. I mean, it is for all the, you know, desire to see people understand their shared humanity. It's when we're fighting each other that we often think of new ideas. But there, the ways in which crises tend to produce innovation is people say, we can't go on like this. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we can't go back. We can't let whatever it was that caused this continue. And if you think of the crises of the last 20 years, the response has tended to be, when can we go back to how it was before? Mm -hmm. um, even COVID, right? So COVID is, in many ways, the most dramatic example of the ways in which, under real pressure, governments have innovated. They've done things that people said were impossible, for better and for worse, and they've taken on extraordinary powers. Um, and it's, it's been a warlike situation, the restrictions of liberty that you only normally see in wartime. But that other thing that tends to come in a war, which is, you know, if we're going to do this, what comes after it has to be better. And if we're going to do this, if we're going to ask these sacrifices of people, particularly young people with COVID, we need to rethink the whole relationship between people and government. That's what the First World War produced. That's what the Second World War produced. Actually, that's what the Cold War produced. The response to COVID has tended to be, when can it be like two years ago? And actually, even in the financial crisis, there was, you know, there was a lot of radical political thinking at the time and people looking for ideas, they tended to be backward-looking ideas. They tended to be, as Arshin said, the ideas of the early 20th century. When people look for ideology now, they tend to look back, not forward. But there was also a sense that the way to manage the crisis was to get to the point where people would feel they were comfortable in the way they'd been comfortable before. And that is not how you drive political innovation. So one of the historical lessons about crisis and political innovation is the stakes have to be high enough that people genuinely believe that there is no going back. And Western societies, which are you know, prosperous, peaceful, elderly in ways they weren't at the start of the 20th century, the tendency is to look back, not forwards. And that's the big challenge. So we are, you know, we live in incredibly experimental times. Technology creates all of the conditions to do things radically differently. And yet when you look at our politics, what tends to happen when the chips are down is there's a desire to cling on to what we've got. Mm. And so even during the Trump years, there was that strong sense that, you know, the fear was we would go back to the 1930s and the hope was we could go back to the 1990s. You know, there was that kind of... It was almost as though we were framing the future against what we knew was the worst of the 20th century and what we thought potentially was the, the optimistic from a Western perspective end of the 
20th century. And the Ukraine war has really, in some ways, sort of reinforced that. It's such an echo of the past. No question, I mean, we're looking at this from the outside. If you were Ukrainian, you would believe this crisis will produce political innovation because there's no going back, I mean, in that scenario. But we're watching it from the outside. And we're viewing it through this prism where I think we're trying to find the comfortable points where we feel that's familiar, we recognise that. At the same time, almost certainly, the politics of the 21st century in 20 years' time is going to be radically different from now. And those are the ideas I haven't heard in the last five, ten years. You may, just stepping back to the pandemic for a moment, because then I, I'm sure we'll want to talk about Ukraine. You made the point, Arshin, about us being interdependent. And you would have thought, David, that a pandemic by its very nature would make people think, oh, well, we're all one world. But what actually happened when huge um, scientific in innovation and technological innovation was used to find vaccines in double quick time. The West kept them for themselves and also lots of countries lied and pretended that they didn't have levels of COVID that they did have. I, I, in, when you look at what happened in the pandemic, what are your thoughts about what we didn't learn and what do you think we, we can learn from it? So I think the, the first thing that we learned is when, when governments were really afraid in March 2020, they all did their own thing. Um, you know, it did, the, the site of authority fell back on national governments and then in a place like the United States on state governments. You, know, you would have had a very different experience of the pandemic in Florida compared to New York. It was not, it was a global event, but very quickly you saw politics, the authority to take decisions. If you're going to tell people they have to remain in their homes, that comes from national or state governments. It does not come in any global sense. I think I probably speak for a lot of people that the immediate sense of it was a kind of solidarity even at the national level. But then very quickly it felt very atomizing. Now, the experience of being locked in your home mm -hmm. is not on the whole an experience of feeling solidarity, it's an experience of feeling alone. And the technology that then was designed to connect us, I think for most people was pretty alienating. And then on top of that, the pandemic itself was a divisive event because it primarily threatened old people and most of the sacrifices that were being asked were being asked of younger people. It was generationally divisive in, a, in democratic politics where generational divides are the biggest divides in how people think about the future. So for all, all the ways in which it was a global phenomenon, you know, pandemics, viruses don't recognise whether you're from Florida or New York, for all the reasons that at the start, I think most people experienced it as a unifying event, it fragmented very, very quickly. And I, I'm afraid it sounds like a sceptical and maybe cynical response. What I would take from that is that hopes of global events generating a kind of sense of global solidarity for political innovation, for now anyway, still look to me some way off in the future. When these crises hit, the places where political decisions get made are the traditional ones still, and that's where we still are. Because we had a period during which there was a sort of political consensus, um, wasn't there? And Labour, I think you've talked about this, you, you know, tended to go along with yeah. what the Conservatives were, were, were saying, and broadcasters were putting up little things, giving out government messages, which I think was perhaps a little bit disturbing and in retrospect was wrong. But there, w there was a sort of sense of, um, we're all in this together to find the answers and we seem to have lost that. But so my experience of it, and I, the book I've just published is about this, it was based on some podcasts I did at the time in the first lockdown when this university was shut about the history of ideas and what crisis te teaches us about change. And my feeling in those early months of the pandemic was there was a lot of talk that politics is on hold. Mm. You know, party politics is on hold, left, right is on hold. What we think of as politics, who's going to win the election? And we're doing something else. But actually what I felt is we were doing a much older form of politics. 
which is the authority of the state is being used to decide life or death questions. The authority of the state is being used to decide how far you can travel from your home, you know, what the distance is between human beings. This was being set by central authority. And the big question was not how are people going to vote, but will they put up with it? You know, which is the deepest question of politics. We franchise out, out to governments the decisions that we don't take for ourselves anymore. And when it gets really serious, there is always a question, will people put up with this? And at the time, we didn't know, and the behavioural scientists were saying, you know, people will only do two weeks of being told to stay in their homes, and then the natural human impulse will resist it. And what we've learned in the last two years is that the majority of people have quite a strong appetite for government taking those decisions. There's a minority who are violently opposed to it, but last few years, right the way through to now, all polling in places like Britain, and in, I think most Western countries, has suggested that the public is further ahead than the state in the desire to have state control in conditions of a crisis. It's not, for now, the grounds of political innovation. So, Arshin, what do you feel about what we didn't learn and what was not innovative politically and can you think of innovative political ideas that we should, sitting here, be considering? Um, I largely agree with what David had to say about um, the sovereignty being reinscribed um, into our politics, the sovereignty of the state, right? Not only over the situation where we could go, what we could do, but over our very bodies as well. Right. So th that is very intrusive um, and a type of sovereignty that is uh, uh, incredibly powerful. Right. So uh, I agree that that was one of the effects. Certainly, it also revealed the lack of global governance and institutions on a global level uh, that could um, appropriately respond to that type of crisis. And apart from you know, the problems that we had on a national level, and regional level, there was simply also a lack of global institutions that could respond to a global pandemic. So institutionally, I think it revealed all the weaknesses that some of us flagged for a long time now. Um, but on a, kind of bringing it back to the individual, and the, the human level, right? Um, it certainly also show, showed and demonstrated how social we are, right? I mean, we're dealing with a mental health crisis now, um, which is largely due to the isolation that many of us experienced during the pandemic. Um, it, I don't know how you felt once the lockdown was over. I, I wanted to hug everyone. On, the crazy guy running around in Cambridge hugging everyone, that was me, right? So, you know, it was, it was almost natural um, to reach out and, and, and to connect. Um, so, it, again, this is a human sentiment, right? It has nothing to do with politics. It can't be engineered, re-engineered. It's innate. And... Any political solution that would be viable in a situation like this needs to be anchored institutionally, of course, needs to reform the current institutions that, that, that we have, but also within an acknowledgement of that universality. And again, it goes back to, to, to the poem. In my opinion, any political innovation cannot be merely local. It can be couched in a local language, but it has to speak to a universal human sentiment. And we used to have that, as I mentioned. We used to have the Gandhis, the Mandelas, you know, all of those people that, that we've studied. And we used also we used to have, you know, the, the type of ideas that were um, anchored in bigger things than you know what is happening locally. Now during the pandemic um, and in general, the Trump politics that David mentioned, it, you know, much of that was, um, you know, pulled back even, even further. And that's not good for our institutions and certainly not for our responsiveness to the next global crisis. But on the good side, we had been all being told by sociologists that there were huge divisions between the young and the old, but actually what we saw was that the young agreeing to suffer massively 
to save old people like me. And I actually found it um, very inspiring and uplifting that um, the young people who lived around me, who were not at risk at all, agreed to ruin their social lives, their academic lives, and their, their, their economic lives to help me, and not just because they were forced to. Did, is there the seed of uh, some positive thinking there? Exactly, absolutely. I mean, that's um, the individual deciding for him or herself what is right. Um, and, you know, connecting on that, on that basis without connecting, right? Showing that empathy, showing that social understanding. Um, and and uh, that is immensely, immensely powerful. Um, but politically, of course, um, that whole situation was then also, um, as it's always pretty much, I mean, we have historical examples for that. It was also used to betray the, the power of the state, as, as David indicated. Um, and it's always difficult to kind of step back from that and to, um, you know, reinstitute the degree of freedom that, that you know, one, had, one used to have before. Um, and so now we are in a kind of interregnum, right? We are in, a, in, a, in an empty, in the dash space between two uh, events, and we don't really know where we are heading. But I think politically, um, we are almost um, consistently and constantly in a, in a crisis mode. And so the time for innovation is always postponed to the next crisis. And it, well, it, it doesn't happen always with the next crisis then. But you've made the point, David, that people don't know the effect of a crisis mm. for many years after the crisis. They analyze it a lot <clears throat> a couple of years later, but it's only, uh, you know, many years later, uh, at least seven or eight, that you can actually say to yourself, this is, these were the ideas that came out of the crisis. Yeah, if, if you compare the financial crisis to COVID, so two years after the financial crisis in 2010, the world looked like it had sort of weathered the storm and politics was a little bit getting back to normal. And six, seven years later, everything had changed. You had Brexit, you had Trump, you'd been through the Eurozone crisis. Your whole political systems had been overturned. France is an example. You know, we may be about to see the latest iteration of that. And stable political systems the long-term consequences of these crises were unpredictable two years out. And I suspect it'll be the same with COVID. So we're, too, we're, we're in that, like Ashin says, we're in that frozen point where it looks like we've survived the immediate crisis, but all of the distributional, generational, economic and other effects have yet to play out. And on the question of young and old, so it was, it, you know, I'm old too, right? And I appreciate all the sacrifices that were made to keep me alive. Um, but, you know, if you do that wartime analogy, the idea is, in return for the sacrifice that you make, we reimagine how this democratic politics works to give you more of a say in your future, but also, actually, better opportunities. And frankly, there has been none of that. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason there has been none of that is that we live in very unusual societies when you think about political innovation. And by we, you know, I'm not including most of the world here, I'm, I'm including... The, the sort of long-standing liberal democracies, Europe, but also places like Japan and increasingly even, you know, inching this way, places like China, not a democracy, but getting there, which is we are societies dominated by old people. And that makes a huge difference. So the, the British government has responded to COVID with economic measures that play to their constituency, which is the elderly, mm. by giving them more. There's been almost nothing, there's, um, unless I've missed it, there's been almost nothing comparable to what might have happened after a war, where young people make the sacrifice, they go off, they fight, they die. And this will happen in Ukraine. This will also, in a warped way, happen in Russia. And in return, you build a land fit for heroes, or you make sure this is the war to end all wars, or you create the welfare state, which is a product of the First World War, the Second World War, or you reinvent the education system, whatever it is. What we seem to have done is just sort of quadruple lock the pensions. And, and why are young people putting up with it? 
I mean, well, here we are at a university. Why? Why aren't they burning uh, it there? I, you know, and like, uh, you know, they they gave up so much, and they got Gavin Williamson. Um, yeah, why? You know, when I was at university, in my first week, we had. I, I sat in at the university. That's how I began my university career, and and I come here and I don't I don't see that. Well, there is a bit of sitting in going on, uh, but but it, but part of the difference is one of the drivers of uh, political innovation and political change is mass movements of young people. I mean, it always has been. Um, the ideas might come from universities or whatever, but they have to take a hold on the whole of the most dynamic parts of any given society. And if you are young, say, in Britain today, your experience of politics is that it is stacked against you. I mean, there is something quite alienating about a democratic political system that just does massively favour a particular constituency. I mean, this is partly just demographics. The reason the baby boomers are called the baby boomers is there are more of them, and they live longer, and they vote more, and they tend to remain in particular mm. places. So young people move to university towns. So Cambridge is now you know, a rock-solid Labour seat, partly because so many young people live here. Unfortunately, if you are young, all the places that you've left behind have all just elected Conservative MPs because your grandparents have just elected them. So, yeah, you can sit in, but unlike in the past, in the past it would be possible to say, if all the young people did yeah. X, there are more of you, you're more powerful, you are the change. Now, if you say to people under the age of 30, if you all did X, actually, it wouldn't make that much difference. Well, yeah, we believed that we could win, and actually, in, that, in those particular battles that we did, we did. Arshin, you've written a lot about movements of um, young people um, in the Arab Spring, and what can we learn from that um, and the... And, some of the very tragic effects of it about innovative political thinking in a crisis? The Arab Spring was really the first so-called postmodern um, revolt or upheaval that we had um, in the 21st century. And it was different from what happened in the 20th century with the revolutions, whether it was in China or in Iran or Cuba or Russia. Um, and, you know, that's why scholars called it postmodern. There was no charismatic figurehead, the type of Lenin, Mao, Khomeini, um, Fidel Castro that you saw in the 20th century. There was no all-encompassing ideology, indeed, no utopia of a better tomorrow, um, no recoding of the individual, you know, the perfect... Um, let's say homo islamicus or the perfect you know worker or whatever it was um, none of that there was no hq that you could uh, conquer and nullify everything so you know it was very much decentered whereas in the 20th century we we had centers of power and then you know they aggregated everything and then it turned into the dystopia of that HQ essentially determining everything. Uh, but the Arab Spring was, was scattered, decentralized. It happened on the ethers of the World Wide Web. You know, there was a bit of a Facebook revolution going on. And so, it, you know, it was very different to what we saw in the 20th century. Those revolutions will never come back because they happened exactly the way they did. Um, but the Arab Spring, um, could be a blueprint of, you know, what may happen in the future. It was transversal in the sense that, you know, different strata of society were involved, galvanized, um, and, you know, there was a ripple effect, a domino effect, not only in the region, but globally, I remember distinctly, you know, students at St. Paul's, um, the Occupy Wall Street movement, you know, Syntagma Square in Athens, uh, Madrid, you know, it, it was not only local, the language was local, but the ambition and was... And wasn't that political innovation? Wasn't there a lot of political innovation going on there, not just in the areas like Tunisia, but but here in Britain as well? Of course it was. I mean, exactly because it was non-hierarchical and, and kind of flat in terms of the organizational structures, it was also based on consensus. So the politics were, were uh, rather progressively democratic, consensual, 
Um, but that probably also explains why they did not turn into a revolutionary change where everything would be changed. When you have these rather, um, you know, non-hierarchical structures and when you base decision-making on uh, consensus, then it is that much more difficult to bring about, um, you know, radical change against a stealthy state. And that's why the deep state came back in Egypt and elsewhere. So there was political innovation in praxis and also in terms of the ideation or kind of the ideas. Um, exactly because the language was universal and that's why it went global. At the same time, it was indicative of, you know, the inability of movements like that to bring about truly revolutionary change of the type that we saw in the 20th century, which may not be a good thing, by the way. You know, those revolutions brought about major mm. um, uh, uh, crises. So, you know, it's just an analytical change. But yes, in terms of political innovation, certainly it was immensely in need. Can I say Thank you. something yes. about that? So, so one of my memories of the Arab Spring, and it sort of speaks to that point that we always look now for the, the thing in the past that reminds us of the future... And one of the questions about the Arab Spring was, what is this? Is this 1989? Is this an end of history mm -hmm. revolution? Is it 1968? Is it a kind of flowering of ideas you know, among young people? Is it 1917? Is it a rerun of an epochal <coughs> event like that? Or the consensus ended up being, is it 1848? That's the thing that it probably most resembled, going all the way back pre-20th century, the 1848 revolutions, which were driven by technological change and were decentered and so on. And in the end, they were the harbinger of the future. So in 1848, you got a glimpse of the world that was coming later in the 19th century. But it took, you know, Marx lived his whole life and never quite saw it, waiting for the promise so of actually, 1848 to be delivered. Uh, yeah. Some of this is really long term. The difference, I would say, between now and 1848 is we haven't got 40 years <laughs> to wait and see how some of these things play out. This has all been speeded up. And the idea that, if you look at the middle of the 19th century, sort of the, the origins of modern democracy were there. It took a long, long time for this to turn into what we now think of as liberal democratic politics. I can't see that repeating itself in the 21st century because it's too slow. Um, a sort of, you know, it, and in a way, 1848 and the Arab Spring, they, they failed in similar ways in that the lack of central organisation, the fact it was so experimental, the fact it was so open-ended, and in a way was back then global, but didn't have a focal point, meant it dissipated, but it also spread and eventually took root. We don't have... I mean, we you know, think well, of the world in 40 years' time. You don't, but uh, younger people, no, but, you know, we might not be here. Yeah, but so they'll be here, but younger people don't have time. I mean, it's no good saying to people, wait 40 years, and then this will all come good. Um, you know, if that's the lesson of some of this decentered, radical, innovative politics, which is going on all over the world, which takes a long, long time to take root and then scale up. It's not like those 20th century revolutions where a small group of people and a charismatic leader take over the post office and the, you know, the administrative mm -hmm. hub of the state, fight a civil war, and then anchor a revolution. If this is going to be that other kind, it's got to be the 21st century version. It's got to be a lot quicker. And for, for now, it hasn't been quicker. Now, I'm going to come in a moment to the audience, but you have also made the point that um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we, we thought we knew what was going on and that, you know, the 1930s could never come back again, and et cetera. And, and more recently, you said, oh, here we are in the 1930s again, and that the, all the things that we thought we were sure of, we were wrong about, and that the world was a lot more unpredictable than we thought. Yes, yeah, so I don't think we are. So I still think the fears that people had sort of post-Brexit, Yeah, not post Britain, yeah. Yeah, the, but that idea that somehow this was a harbinger of the return of fascism, I always thought that that was enormously overblown. But there's a war going on in Europe which is rec would be recognisable. I mean, you know, one way to ask the question is if you took someone from Weimar, Germany, and showed them contemporary America or contemporary Britain and said, does it look familiar? They would say, no. I mean, it's like you're living in paradise. This is prosperous, secure, non-violent politics. What do you... You think fascism is coming? 
You've got some, you know, TV guy in the White House. That's not fascism. But if you showed someone from Weimar, Germany, Ukraine and Russia, they would say, oh, yeah, that's our world. Um, and we've sort of got it the wrong way around. As we were so preoccupied with ourselves, we're so solipsistic, we so think that, you know, Brexit signals the end of times, that we don't notice that actually we're just doing that more staid politics in a slightly different way. But it's not rocking the foundations of what we, you know, the way we've done it for the last generation or more. But the world is going in all sorts of different directions. And the country that's really facing up to this at the moment is Germany. You know, Germany has lived a kind of post-1990, post-unification dream of a new kind of connected world in which you trade with Russia and in the end everybody becomes friends and wants to hug each other. And in the last six weeks, the whole thing has blown up. And they've doubled their defence budget and Angela Merkel is, you know, having to justify her entire political career because people wake up in a crisis to the ways in which one of the illusions of modern politics is we think we can do without politics. You know, I mean, in a way, that's almost the deepest paradox, which is what modern politics, when it goes well, saves us from is having to think about politics. That's its great promise. You know, if you live in certain kinds of societies, you have to think about politics morning, noon and night because the stakes are mm -hmm. so high. And the thing that we kind of hanker for in a way, is to go back to when we didn't have to think about it so much. I've heard people say it over the last few years, the thing that's been so draining is you have to think about politics all the time. But we live in a political world, and I think we're realising that one of the illusions of modern politics is thinking that we can franchise politics mm. out to those weird people called politicians who will do it for us. And then something happens, even like the pandemic, and you suddenly realise those people have our lives in their hands. And so if we don't pay attention to what they're doing... One day we're going to wake up and we'll be really afraid. No, I'm going to come to the audience and the audience at home. Yes. I think, do we have some microphones or would you like to... Shout. Oh, I think it's better with a microphone because Arshin would be able to hear better. Thanks. Um, well, firstly, thank you for your talk, and uh, it's given me a lot of optimism, and I'm imagining all the amazing rewards that are come, going to come to us young people for our <laughs> sacrifice. Um, uh, but I'd like to return to your point about the relative increased speed for the 21st century, uh, 21st century political innovation, and to what extent do you think that this has to be driven by technology, new technology? Mm -hmm. So I think, Arshin, this is an area that you are particularly interested in. Did you hear the question? Uh, yes, I did. It was about speed. Um, and, I and, 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 and technology. technology. Yeah. Technology. Well, you know, we are living in a totally different um, world in terms of the te technological innovations and the capabilities that it gives us. Um, as civil society to express ourselves. Um, you know, the decision to change things on a local level can be made by each and every one of you. Uh, whenever you step out of this lecture theater, you go on your Twitter site or Facebook, um, you know, page, uh, you can innovate, you can change, you can affect, uh, and you can connect. And this is totally different to even my generation. Um, uh, we didn't have this, this um, uh, the technology behind us to amplify, right? So this is certainly something that affects and has affected uh, politics. But on the other side, and here again, I mean, going back to the Arab Spring, that was a good example of what it could do in terms of emancipation, right? Um, but that was also a stage when the internet was not governed in the way that it is today. It was a stage when there was not this, you know, fake news machinery that we are experiencing um, with reference to the wars. Um, you know, it already started, indeed. Um, uh, you know, with the wars on terror on the traditional media. But when we have a look at what is happening now in terms of the, you know, propaganda, it's, it's totally different. And it has exactly to do with the fact that uh, you can speed up um, that um, counter-reality and you can bring it pretty much everywhere, right? Um, and so there is then here a constant fight between um, the truth seekers on the one side were not as well equipped as uh, the state um, in creating, um, you know, realities or, you know, trying to find the truth. So technology goes both ways, whereas it started out 
certainly the internet as a place of emancipation and social mobilization. It's now turned into something very different to my mind. It seems to me that we are battling really that fake news machinery exactly because of the speed of the news that is coming out uh, and the dissemination right into our living rooms, right? Um, Alexa, Siri, all of them, um, you know, bombarding us with, with, with news. A totally, totally new type of power, really, um, to traditional forms of power, by far more penetrative um, but in the end, as we know, where there is power, there is resistance. It will also translate and transmute into something else when you make use of it in a way that is emancipatory and feeds into social struggles that we are experiencing today. Thank you. More questions? Yes. I just want to say, uh, echo the person who asked the question there. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, I noticed that there are probably some pretty radical conclusions that can be taken from your interpretations of political crisis and the, and the outcomes, or perhaps that's just my own biases, but there's a, a quote by um, Frederick Jameson and Slavoj Žižek that I quite like and, and think about quite frequently. It is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. And I was, and often people on the hard left will say that, oh, things are the result of capitalism, they're the result of imperialism. 2008, they'll say COVID, or the response to COVID, they'll talk about economic change with China being this neo-imperialistic state. So I was wondering, do you think that liberal capitalism is as good as we can get? Well, David, <laughs> you uh, uh, can answer so that I'm gonna, one, I'm going to answer a, that yeah, question. Yeah, I'd answer that question way. he didn't ask. In two yeah. minutes. Uh, uh, but because it, you also mentioned the end of the world, as well, uh, you know, it's, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And one of the features of when people think now about crisis and political change is a lot of it does happen in the shadow of pretty apocalyptic thinking, which does paralyze or freeze certain kinds of political possibility. So you know, we're doing this often in the shadow that if it goes really wrong, it's the end of everything. And that is not a liberatory philosophy. You know, millenarian thinking, on the whole, actually, is paralyzing. Um, and it also empowers governments, because you know, under those conditions, the person who comes along and promises to keep you relatively safe tends to get a hearing. So it is, in some ways, I think it is true that it's easier to imagine the end of the world because it frames the horizon of change than to imagine whether it's the end of capitalism or something else, or a completely radically new way of doing politics because those visions tend to require an open horizon, that sense that the future is open. And, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but when I try and think about the future 30, 40, 50 years ahead, relative to maybe how I would have thought about it myself 30 years ago, it looks more closed, mm -hmm. partly because it's hemmed in by these existential risks, which are real, and you know, we're, you know, none of us should be under any illusions that we're not living in a very dangerous world, but it's simultaneously hemmed in by the fear of the end of everything, and so radically experimental for some of the ways that Arshin was talking about. You know, we're living in a world simultaneously of incredibly rapid technological and social experimentation, and a kind of frozen and rigid political economy. And that combination is, is really hard to navigate, I think. Um, I mean, I, is liberal capitalism the best we can get? No, I would have thought probably not, not least because it seems at some point to lead to the end of the world, you know, it's sort of <laughs> chewing up the planet. But that thing of imagining an alternative future, and I'll just say one more thing, which is in order to imagine that alternative future, you do also have to imagine the hard work of institutional political change. So one of my memories of uh, Bernie Sanders's campaign last time was he, he had a 16-point program for revolutionizing American capitalism and sort of socializing it. Points 1 to 15 were all very exciting and would make a real, really big difference. And point 16 was, to do this, we need to change the Constitution, and that's really hard. Mm. And you might think that, therefore, either point 16 should be point 1, or, if it's really hard, you might not be able to do points 1 to 15. That's the challenge. Arshin, I think you were very keen to come in on this one. Well, it's a, it's a big, bigger question that we can, we can tackle, but um, it, it, there are various forms of neoliberal capitalism, and we all know that, you know, it is part of the problem indeed, and I think 
um, the younger generations are entirely aware of that. I think some of the you know, narratives floating around permeating the so-called Extinction Rebellion, they are tackling some of the questions uh, that are necessary to be tackled in order to have a better future. I mean, that's where it comes from, right? Um, but as David rightly said, I mean, the institutions are so old and so heavy, right, that it is that much more difficult to reform them from within. Now, the path of revolution is not one that I'd like to take. Um, I don't like immediate political change. It usually yields, you know, immense problems uh, for society. I've seen it in Iran. I've studied it in, in Iran. And we've seen it elsewhere. So the only way out of this is to find uh, an economic system that is uh, responsive to, uh, you know, the strata of society that needs support. We have this in continental Europe, for instance. There are social market economies that are functioning very well, um, where there is a distributional welfare state that actually uh, normatively and an actual institutional fact is responsive to, um, you know, the more disadvantaged strata of society. Um, I think, again, in Britain, there was a tendency to lose a little bit of that along the way. Certainly, the United States is not an economic model that is um, socially just. Um, and so there are these hybrid models that, you know, one can learn from where institutionally really it does work and where, you know, the lower strata of society in terms of income um, can appeal to the welfare state whenever there is a problem. We can see it right now, actually, that, um, you know, some of those systems are working better in continental Europe compared to elsewhere. Can I say something very brief? Yeah. I mean, you know, the illustration of how hard institutional change is, I said, take someone from the 1930s and show, us, show them our world. So they would look at our world, take someone from 1930s Britain, our world, m blow their minds, mind-boggling the level of change socially, economically, you know, in our sort of mora sexual morality, everything else. And then they go, but you've got all the same political institutions. You know, mm -hmm. like the House of Lords, you didn't... <laughs> think to abolish that. It's still the same political parties, same electoral system. The structure is entirely the same when everything has changed. And I imagine, you know, over that time they would say, well, something is out of sync with something here because you've changed everything and you've left your political institutions sort of in aspect from the 1930s. Mm. And at some point something has got to <coughs> Or, you know, in the United States, the same thing would... So you still got the Electoral College, you're still running your politics mm. the same way. But everything has changed. Something has to change institutionally, or you do get these two things moving, and eventually people will give up on politics, because the politics is frozen. All the dynamism, all the energy is social. Thank you. Some more points. There's a woman at the back. In ah, yes, thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Right. Hello. Do you think these current crises will spur young people towards more traditional political influencing, like voting, pro more bigger protests, like the uh, some Margaret Thatcher strikes and the uh, poll tax? Do you think that will happen, or do you think it will change to a more online way of influencing politics? Thank you. I'm going to take, because we're coming near to the end, a few points. And I don't know if we've got anybody at home. They've all gone to sleep. Um, <laughs> uh, at the back. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. It was very insightful. I was just wondering that given um, this, uh, many developments, what would be the centrality of the nation state? Would that still continue to be as important? Uh, and um, also this is uh, with, say, movements like climate change, which need global... Uh, addressing, which has failed, and also with, um, say, President Zelensky going to the UN and saying that Article 1 is not being followed. So what's the point of the other article? So where do multinational organizations come in um, and if the nation state will continue to have its way? Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Any other point? Yes. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask, um, what can we learn from the pandemic? 
about how to tackle climate change with political innovation. Thanks. Thank you. And I'll take one more. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I was, uh, although you um, didn't seem to mention about innovation, but I thought Cambridge is actually very innovative because of Cam Cambridge Ana Analytica <laughs> uh, that uses computers and our personal, <laughs> digital personal um, behavior and targeting um, uh, political messaging. And in some ways, do you see with Siri and all the other, uh, 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 all, all the other system, how, how do you say it? Our our choices of 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 how do you say it? our our bias on certain things are already known to the politicians mm -hmm. and be already sold. I I we don't need to have a politically. We don't. They will satisfy us through the authoritar uh, authoritarian system. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you to try to answer all those at once, but you can choose your favorite. And we've got so four So you've minutes. got, yeah, yeah, as the, as the nation state had it, are multinational organizations any good? Um, could young people save us all? Um, climate change, you know, the pandemic, does it tell anything? And, and then Cambridge Analytica, a very good example of evil politicians innovating to control us all. So you can, you, you can choose first what would you like okay, to so, finish uh, by Okay, so has saying, the nation David? state had its day? No. Are international organisations useless? No. Um, will young people save us all? No. <laughs> um, so on the um, what can we learn, which is a really interesting question, what can we learn about climate change from... The pandemic. So there are lots of grounds for optimism, I think. So what the pandemic showed is that when the chips are really down, innovation can happen very quickly, yeah. technical and political. You know, it's not just they invented these vaccines, but they rolled them out. They got people, not in all parts of the United States, but in most countries, very different political systems, got people to take them up, overcame resistance to them. You know, a lot of the fake news about this went away, and we are much better off as a result. And you know, a lot of people have pointed out it wasn't even that expensive. You know, the, the support that states gave to the vaccine program, if you scaled that up 100 times, which states could afford, think what you could do for the innovation of climate change. The reason to be pessimistic is that the crises were so different. So the thing about COVID is when it hit, it hit in a time frame where action had to be taken this day. There was a two weeks in which all governments around the world did this thing. Climate doesn't have that effect. It rolls slowly a lot of the action has to be preemptive. Now, if you look at the pandemic, there was very little preemptive action in the sense that even when it was coming from Italy, you know, it was a week away mm. and nothing was being done. Democratic governments, and indeed I think most governments, though autocratic governments might be better at this, are not good at preemptive action. So what you need is some weird combination where you take the optimistic lessons from COVID, but you engineer the climate crisis to look like that. The difficulty is imagining something that's the equivalent of COVID in the world of climate, something where people think, we've got a week to sort mm -hmm. this out. And that is actually a terrifying thought. So, Arshin. I'd say yes to everything that was said. So, yes, uh, you know, <laughs> young people will rescue us. And, and um, yes, the nation state will uh, be reformed, I believe. I think what is needed certainly is, um, you know, post-national future. I hope that this crisis in um, Ukraine will not yield a new type of politics that is based on dichotomies and binaries and, you know, good versus bad. And, you know, the world is simply too complex to, uh, you know, hark back to these um, kind of outdated categories. And it really goes back to, 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 the, to the poem. You cannot fight fire with fire. And what I'm seeing right now, unfortunately, and what we're seeing right now is that, you know, some of the political formulas that are being articulated are really, really not fit for purpose. The complexity, interconnectedness, interdependencies magnified by artificial intelligence, the new technologies, what was said about Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica, need, require a new type of thinking, a new type of language that is appreciative of these complexities. 
I don't see it, but I'm hopeful. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank you both. Um, although you, um, I was a bit sarcastic at the beginning about professors, I think you really did have a lot of very good ideas. And so, and I'd like to thank all the audience. The audience at home, I don't thank them because they didn't come up with any good questions. But um, I, I, it's been a, a terrific session, so I would like you to join me in thanking our speakers. Um, and especially, I, I would like to thank you very much, Arshin, for doing this when you were not well. And it was really very kind of you, and also so Persian of you to begin and end with poetry. I thought that was great. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.